Okay, so today I want to introduce you to the extremely important topic of building science. It's important enough that when you're in third year, <clears throat> you get a whole, a whole course called building science. And then when you're in master's, you can take another course called advanced science of the building envelope. <clears throat> so that would indicate that it's probably pretty important. The, the issue with science and <clears throat> building envelopes is that there's a lot of aspects of physics that impact the performance of the building envelope. So if you think back to what we were looking at uh, in, in building construction with the advent of a structural frame and the separation of the structure holding up of the building from the envelope, sort of the protecting of the environmental barrier <clears throat> means that what happened throughout sort of the modern movement was that buildings that used to be massive and thick with big, 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 thick stone walls that could withstand hundreds of years, ravages of time, all of a sudden didn't have to be so thick because they weren't holding up the building anymore. Interior structure was holding up the building. <clears throat> and the envelope started to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And so if you look at a lot of contemporary buildings, we have a structural frame and we have a curtain wall. Now this envelope here is an old fashioned one and therefore the, the brick piers that you see here are that thick. That's basically solid brick all the way through if not some steel um, complementing that, embedded and surrounded by brick. But the, the structure is very solid, it's very thick, and therefore for the environmental impact to go in and out of that wall, it takes a bit because it's just so thick. So what we're going to talk about today is the idea of the building envelope, building construction, this third skin that needs to be very carefully crafted now because it has become quite thin and therefore pretty vulnerable uh, to environmental decay and, and other kinds of problems. So that's our first skin. When I say the building envelopes, the third skin, that's the first skin. You know, we're born naked. Generally speaking, they cover us up pretty fast, not because we're ugly or anything. They're like, oh, a cute baby, cover it up. It's, it's because, you know, we, we are vulnerable, because all we have is our skin in order to, to moderate temperature, to keep us hot, to keep us cold. If we need, if we, we perspire to get rid of heat. We, we shiver and our, the hairs on our arms go up in order to trap still air against our skin to keep us warmer. And so when we look at architecture, we have to take that and understand that somehow the, the, the interior environment has to moderate the climate immediately around us and a lot of the environmental change has to happen at that envelope. So going back to what I, the graph I showed you, the chart I showed you last week from Victor Olge's book, we have to understand all of the, the physiological issues associated with the human body and how how it reacts to temperature, relative humidity, heat, wind, air movement, all of those kind of uh, impacts so that when we design the building, we can design the building in a way that keeps people comfortable. So there's two main things that we're trying to get at in terms of what temperature we keep insides of buildings at. And if you, I don't know, you're probably just as happy now that you're not in high school or elementary school in Toronto right now, there's like an amazingly hot debate on regarding the fact that the majority of schools in the, in the board in, in Toronto have no air conditioning. And students and teachers are sweltering in the classrooms because the buildings are not air conditioned and they're really badly designed. They have windows, half of which don't open, there's no shading devices, the sun's beating in, is, you know, kids are just, you know, dripping with sweat and we don't have a policy like we have on when it's too cold that says, well, kids don't have to go out for recess because it's too cold, they must stay inside. There's no policy in Ontario or anywhere else in Canada that I know 
that says if, it's, if, if the temperature exceeds this value inside a building, you have to send the students home. There's nothing like that. And so legally, the schools are obliged to stay open and parents can drop those poor children off while the parents go and spend the day in the air-conditioned office downtown. Um, so it's, when you look at the temperature requirements inside a building, I would say we are supposed to, as architects, try to make it a comfortable temperature. What that range is, is debatable, and it depends on your climate, it depends on the time of the year, what you're, what you're accustomed to. So that would be relating to human physiology, and then the second one would be we have to keep it to a temperature so that it doesn't get so cold that the pipes freeze. So if you've ever been in a, a situation and we've had some pretty deep freeze <laughs> times in the past few years in southern Ontario, or every once in a while, like, pipe freezes and it bursts and it's like a big problem. So we have to keep the building to, to a point where <laughs> the pipes don't freeze. And I would say with increased global warming, we we'll probably have to start to be worried about maybe spontaneous combustion. If the temperature gets too high, all of a sudden your building just doesn't go poof because it's too hot. So these would be extreme ranges of what we need to provide in terms of the interior environment. And so to, to look at all of the sort of the, the metabolism and the thermal balance that has to be maintained around people, we have our convection currents, we have our radiation of our body heat out into a colder environment, and we have evaporation if, in fact, that environment is, is reversed. So we have our first skin that has to mediate with the environment. We have our second skin, because most of us actually go around wearing clothes of some description, and that is a, a, the second skin then will vary depending on, you know, time of, time of year and, and maybe just your mood. <clears throat> so we, we then as well, when we're looking at our, in our buildings, understand that in the summertime, people are generally wearing, you know, less sleeves, a little lighter weight clothes, and so therefore they're, they're trying to wear clothes that are going to be able to carry them without much modification from an indoor temperature to an outdoor temperature. And in the wintertime, we may dress a little more warmly inside buildings. The buildings will tend to get a bit cooler. And then we will layer it up to go outside. But essentially, the, the, the clothing layer that we can expect people to wear inside in the winter is a bit more than in the summertime. The rest of that has to be moderated by passive design, mechanical heating and air conditioning, etc. And so the third skin is what we are providing in order to adjust the climate and control the building environment between whatever you're wearing for clothing and whatever temperature it is outside. Be that significantly colder or significantly hotter. And we have to understand then that when we put a, a building around us, that there's all sorts of physics acting on that building, given that we have pressure differentials between the, pressure, the air pressure outside a building and inside, based on it by temperature and relative humidity, um, the way the sun's shining on the building, the way the wind's blowing on the building. And so our building envelope which I call our third skin, has to be able to mediate then between the environment and our second skin to make us comfortable. If nobody is occupying a building, then it doesn't really need to be that comfortable. You just need to stop the pipes from freezing. So the reason that we moderate in the indoor environment has to do with human occupation and human comfort. And just again, that varies around the world. I know I always have, um, have a lot of international students in the masters, uh, the, the M1 studio, and uh, half, half of them are getting like super excited for it to snow, because they've never seen snow before. And the other ones are thinking it's already, it's way too cold, and everyone else is going, no, 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 it's, it's hot, just wait, it's gonna get cold. So your, your, your culture and your acclimatization really does make a big difference. I know when, when I was a kid, Nobody had air conditioning in their houses. We were just all acclimatized, no matter where you went, for it being a little bit warmer, 
people have grown physiologically to be acclimatized to less of a temperature swing. <coughs> this is a, a, a building, I think I posted something to the, the Beacon Facebook page about this. There's an article written quite recently, <coughs> and it was a competition that was done in the mid-1990s by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC, <coughs> for a project called The Healthy House. And I always have looked on that as being a very odd thing to do. Because why would you have to hold a competition for someone to design specifically? The purpose of this is to have it as a healthy house. Does that not infer that all other houses are designed to be unhealthy? By default, anything else that's not designed to be healthy is unhealthy. So we should be designing all of our buildings, no matter what they're used for, to be healthy interior environments as well as comfortable environments. <coughs> so if we go back again to Vitruvius, which wrote the first, he wrote the first kind of building code treatise on architecture. Um, he starts off by saying a building must satisfy several general requirements. It must be safe in respect of structure, fire, and health. That makes sense. Economical in initial cost and operating cost. Even Vitruvius way back was saying, you know, you can build something really fancy, but you have to be able to maintain it. It should be aesthetically pleasing. And it should be inoffensive to the senses and an aid in sensory tasks. So it shouldn't stink. But inoffensive to the senses, we have five senses, not just smell. So how is it inoffensive to our sense of touch, sight, <coughs> hearing? So it was in interesting that way back, in you know, around the year zero, that someone was actually thinking about architecture in these kinds of terms as architecture being sensory. That it's not just shelter. It's not just protecting me from death by the elements. So we went beyond the idea of building as shelter. So we looked at vernacular design <clears throat> the other week, uh, indigenous <coughs> design, and a lot of those were not not super comfortable, but they were enough to allow people to survive with a relative sense of comfort. You know, we go from low technology shelters, which would stop people from dying, would keep people maybe from heat stroke, get you out of the sun, put you into the shade. But when we talk about modern <coughs> culture, civilized culture, <laughs> developed nations, we are charged as architects with designing shelters, buildings, as being a lot more. They have to provide people with a certain level of satisfaction in terms of their interior environment. They should uplift our spirits. They should make us feel better. Walking into your building should make someone feel good as opposed to walking in your building, it's like, ooh, smells in here. Oh, it's kind of damp. It's too warm. It's too dark. Don't like the colors. Don't like my class. Whoa. All the things. Like, you, you have to walk into a place, and it should uplift you. That's me, a, a, a check of a, of a good building. Do I walk in the building and feel better for going into the building, or do I want to just turn around and, and leave? So what we have evolved to in terms of our profession are specialists in designing high performance buildings. So the shelter of the tent was basically low tech, low performance, whereas buildings now out of steel, glass, concrete, uh, innovative plastic systems, aluminum, all, all the materials we use now have a much higher level of performance that's required. And it's something that's kind of ratcheted up um, slowly over the years as we 
have accumulated wealth, as technology has developed, as we accumulate our expectations of comfort. Because I go back to, you know, thinking back when they're, and they're, they're debating this on talk radio this week about the schools, because it would cost, in the city of Toronto, billions of dollars to retrofit just the public system schools with air conditioning. So how can you justify billions of dollars for a problem that might only be a couple of weeks long in the year? One. And then thinking back and looking at temperatures over the decades and highs and lows and stretches of heat, etc. And this isn't the first time it's happened. This isn't the first time that we've had a stretch of super hot weather where people just had to kind of suck it up maybe and just deal. And then tomorrow it's actually it's going down to 12 or 10 tonight. And then tomorrow's going to be a high of 19. And by next week it'll be, you know, oh well, it's, it's cold out. Let's not really worry about that <coughs> hot weather thing. So as architects, we have to be concerned about these performance issues and as well the, the expectations that people have. Because right now I guess people's expectations are so much higher that their, their intolerance is also very high. People can't tolerate being uncomfortable anymore. So when we look at the material palette and understand that you know, shelter's not, shelter is just not enough, we have to look at buildings then as sort of almost technological symbols that we have to work with and understand. And one of the things I think is the, the crux of a lot of the issues that we're having in terms of the climate change and global warming has to do with, again, expectations and a bit of a lag. And so modern movement architecture, which started off with some of the works I was showing you of, of Wright and Le Corbusier and, and very sort of glass buildings that were single glass, no insulation, skyscrapers like the, the ones in New York City by Mies and, and the Lever House, Seagram Building, that basically had metal skins, almost no insulation. Basically, they are radiators. You pump heat into them, and they're heating up all of New York City. Well, now we don't build buildings quite as bad as that anymore. They don't necessarily look that much different on the outside, but they perform a lot better. The problem is that increasing performance has, has costs money because the building envelopes that we have to design have to be that much better, that much tighter, you know, double, triple, quad glazing instead of single glazing. Obviously, four layers of glass, even if you know nothing about architecture compared to one layer of glass, this must cost more. Okay, just, it's just logical. But the problem is that a lot of the people in developing nations, places that are very good at, at copycatting what things look like, have copied a style of architecture that's inherently bad in terms of its building science performance. So if you look at a glass skyscraper and you realize that if we have a building that's covered mostly with glass, the thermal performance of glass is next to zero if it's just a single piece of glass, and you take that and you take someone in a, in a developing nation and they have less money but want a North American looking lifestyle, they're copying the bad things verbatim. And so one of the things that's the issue with a lot of the <clears throat> greenhouse gas emissions that, that China is going through has been <coughs> massive copying of a style of architecture that really wasn't very good in the first place, but that is so uh, associated with developed lifestyle and lifestyle and what the, what the West has that the way I look at it, it's our responsibility to try to rectify the way we design buildings so that if other nations, which should be able to live as nicely as we do, want to copy, we give them something good to copy. So we need to copy high quality performance buildings, not low quality ones. So we're going from the age of technique, which I've been talking to you in 
building construction about to technology, traditional methods to building science. We no longer have the, <clears throat> I would say, crutch of relying on massive, massive envelopes to hedge our bets as to how, how big does that stone have to be to hold that up? Well, we'll make it a little bit bigger and it won't fall down. How thick does that wall have to be? Well, it can be a little bit thicker. Whereas you start to look at sort of modern stone and modern um, buildings, we're dealing with what we call veneers. That the, the stone on a building now, or a brick, is usually in, in the range of 90 to 100 millimeters thick. In some cases, thinner than that, which is really capable of doing almost nothing in terms of its role in the building envelope. It can, it can hold some moisture from migrating across it. That's about it. The other thing that's changed over the years would be additional pressures on modern buildings because of lifestyle. Now, it, it probably sounds like really gross, but when I was a kid, kids got a bath, unless you got really, really muddy. Little kids don't have sweat glands like teenagers do. You, you would give your kid a bath maybe every fourth night. And then you'd also get your hair washed. But between then, you kind of got looked at, you washed your hands, you washed your feet, you went to bed. You didn't get a bath. Now, people here have an expectation that they should have a hot shower at least every day. If it's really hot and humid outside, you might get one in the morning. And you might come home at the end of the day and go, oh, wow, I stink. I'm going to get another one. So we've got two showers happening. We have dishwashers, we have washing machines, we have dryers, we've got all sorts of um, maybe greater expectations for cooking, so there's a lot more humidity going into interior environments. Back in the day when people all heated their buildings in, in Canada with like hot water radiators, there was no system of humidification. Now we understand that in order to maintain better health, we need to humidify our air to make us healthier. So now we have air supplied heating systems that are um, given over to humidif humidifiers that put moisture into the air. So the air that's going around in your house, if you've got a forced air system, probably has a humidifier on it. And that humidity is also putting pressure inside the buildings. And so this has also made it much more difficult for thin buildings and even old, thick buildings to perform to standard. We have to look at issues of safety. So going through some of the ideas, again, from Vitruvius and taking and modernizing them to some of our, our newer building codes. And the building codes are a set of legal documents that we as architects must design to, to protect the the general public from us being incompetent. <coughs> and so if we look at so the first priority of, of a building is safety. And so to be safe, it has to have structural strength and rigidity, so it shouldn't fall down. Two, it has to have resistance to the initiation and spread of fire. And three, control of air and water quality and a means for waste disposal. So fire safe and sanitary safe. You don't want the, you know, the toilet water backing up into the house or the sewers backing up into the house, etc. So number one would be safety. Going back again to Vitruvius, he called on economy. And to achieve economy, it must be well matched to its purpose. So if somebody asks you to design a barbecue pit, you don't give them a swimming pool. Like you design for what you're supposed to design, for the functions that it's supposed to satisfy. Um, have durable materials and components. I mean, this might 
seem really obvious, but there are some materials on the market that aren't very durable. You will go around and you'll see some buildings whose facades seem to be falling apart, paint peeling off. That's not very durable. And in, on top of that, they should have reasonable maintenance and operating costs. So if you're going to put some <clears throat> really innovative, funky plastic skin on a building that's all laser cut with patterns, but it's a fire trap because it can go up in flames, or you put it on the building for the year and all of a sudden you see it's all crinkled and falling apart and you have to remove it and replace it, that's not so good. Or if you design a facade that's got so much going on that it's impossible to clean. And, you, you know, probably most of you guys haven't experienced this, but I imagine most girls have one article of clothing that you know is a really cool, cool piece. But if you have to wash it and iron it, you go, how did anybody ever make that and iron it because it looks ruined when I'm finished it because you can't get it back into the shape it was because it's got nooks and crannies and pleats and things like that. We do that with our building envelopes where people will design something that's really elaborate, elaborated, perforated facades, and then they go, okay, someone else can figure out how to clean this. You know, you can get up there with a toothbrush. You know, punish somebody. Get, you know, get the people from the penitentiary out to your building and, you know, say, your punishment is going to be to climb this with a rope and clean it with a toothbrush. Your own toothbrush. So, you know, think about cleaning things. And I know it's just my, the mom in me that keeps bursting out every once in a while, but things have to be maintained and kept clean. I was staying at this really, really nice hotel in Vancouver. Um, so I was on the 30th floor, a beautiful uh, uh, tower. And the, sort of the funky detail at the corner of the tower is that the, the glass comes back, and I had nice angled columns. It was like a to-die-for place to actually to die in because I was so sick. I just went back, and I'm in this beautiful suite. I said, I've got a nice sunset. I'm just going to sit here and appreciate my room. But the, the glass is on an angle, and so what happens is when it rains, all the dirt, so the, the, the dirt is on that facade. So facades that are vertical clean better. Facades that lean on an angle don't clean so well. And so, you know, it would be a surface that it would have been nice if they just cleaned it for me before I got there and was sick, but they didn't. Um, but there's just funny little details on buildings that require more maintenance. Inoffensive. <coughs> to be inoffensive and in aid of sensory tasks, it must provide control of odors, light, and sound vibrations. So odors... So if you're doing multifamily housing, do you like curry? And do you want to smell the curry next door? I don't mind the curry if you invite me over, right? But if I've got home and I've got nothing on the table and I smell bacon in somebody else's place, I get that in my neighborhood because I'm in a very Jewish neighborhood and I, I'll drive home and everyone will have, because it's very orthodox and they're not allowed to, to cook on Friday night. So people will have the soup on. So you can smell the soup cooking in the neighborhood because that way there's something that's prepared for people to eat over the weekend that they don't have to cook. Um, and the way they get around that, and I, I bought a, a house from um, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi at one point. They had a gas cooktop. And this is a cheat for sure. What they did was to put the gas cooktop on before the sun went down and just leave the soup on. So when I got in there, I ended up having to replace the cooktop because underneath it was completely burnt out because of just being on for 24 hours every week, like just to keep something going so that nobody had to turn any switches on or off. I thought it was a genius, actually, way to get around things if a bit fire, fire problem. So how do we control odors? Light, we'll talk about quite a bit through this course in the next one, but you know, light coming in, light, this is comfortable light right now, but if that was sunlight <coughs> beating on you and you were sitting there dripping with sweat and there wasn't any else, anywhere else to move in the room, or you'd see everybody kind of shifting that way if the sun was, was shining there. And then sound vibrations. <coughs> Your noises are fine to yourself. 
Other people's noises are not so good. So we, we find that when we have to cohabitate, um, when, when you're down on the, the ground floor and somebody's clipping along on the second floor with high heel spike shoes on, when we're having uh, meetings in the wardroom and you guys play the piano, and we can't really hear what we're talking about, so he's going, somebody's got to go there and wreck that piano. Um, noise. I can remember once, and even in detached houses it happens, attached houses it could be worse, because you get um, clients that will, will really cut down on materials that deaden the, the transfer of noise from apartment to apartment, because they cost more money. They're heavy, heavy mass materials will dampen sound. And so you get issues. The reason why they'll often ask people in apartments to put carpet down is to stop the noise of the footfall. So if somebody's walking with high heels, and I had two friends. I lived in a high-rise apartment at 33 Isabella in Toronto when I was going to school. And I had one of my friends was on like the 24th floor, and one was on the 25th floor. And <clears throat> my friend that paced was living above my friend that doesn't pace. And I remember getting phone calls from my, my, the friend who was living below saying, you have to do something about this person because they're having, they have spike heels on and it's hardwood floors and they're walking back and forth and they're walking back and forth. It's <laughs> driving me crazy. You know? And so that kind of sound transmission as an architect, how do we do that? Do we require people to have slippers? Like, I'm sorry, you're coming into my building. Everyone has to wear cushion sold slippers. You know, do you put something dead? How do you put something on the floor to deaden the sound? Um, and even in detached <coughs> buildings, you can still get sound because buildings are often in cities very <coughs> close. I had a my first house in Toronto after I graduated was a, a single family house at a Young and Lawrence area, a little narrow thing. It was only 15 feet wide. Next house is 15 feet wide, and there was this much space between the houses. How anybody got in there? to lay those bricks. They must have had the skinniest masons ever. So <clears throat> there was renters that moved in next door. And it was the this, this summer that uh, Peter, Peter Gabriel's album, So, came out. And the song of the summer was Sledgehammer. And I was sitting, I was sitting in my living room. And all of a sudden, my entire house was shaking with that song. And I, I, mean, I liked it, but it was a bit loud. And I was trying to figure, like, I'm home by myself. Like, what am I doing? How did I do this? And it was the neighbor. And they just cranked it up. They would have parties in the middle of the night, and they just, they, we had to keep calling the police on them. They would just crank up the music so loud that my house vibrated. And so sound vibrations are, are big deals. And understanding what spaces are used for and how to stop that transfer. So when we think about our... <clears throat> our third skin, our third skin being our building envelope. I'm going to try and really simplify this problem. It's made of opaque elements, things you cannot see through, transparent elements, things you can see through, and the details that join them together. Simple, but not so simple. It's actually pretty easy to detail a transparent element. I have a piece of glass. Done. I've got triple glazing. Better. Wall system. Okay, I've got, you know, brick veneer, and I've got an airspace, and I've got insulation, and a vapor barrier, and drywall, and good. I've got an opaque element. I've got a wall. Easy. But it's where those two things come together that we have the details of the architecture and the places where those details will either work or they'll fail. And work or fail depending on <coughs> what might come in and out of those, those joins in the building. Is it air coming through? Is it water coming through? Is it light, smell, vibrations? And so our third skin then <clears throat> is supposed to manage the climate. Heat, cold, sun, light, and breezes. Plus you could add in odors. It has to manage that. And I'll talk more throughout the course about what manage means beyond making sure that in the winter it's warm inside, in the summer it's cool inside. 
has to be durable. It has to, it has to stand the ravages of time. People, most people's biggest thing that they will ever spend money on is their house. You know, think of the price of a single family house in Toronto now, the average price is like a million dollars. A million dollars. Do you want a million dollars and have somebody say, oh, well, but you know, you really should replace the windows because the builder put in crappy ones, but the kitchen <laughs> countertop's granite. Okay, I've got a really nice granite countertop, but uh, the heat's all going out the windows because they're bad. We need durable materials, and it has to look good because otherwise, why would you be in architecture school? If you have something that is the top two and is ugly, no one's, no one's going to be happy. They won't care. Likewise, if it looks really good and they come inside and they can't get it warm enough or cold enough, they'll also be pretty unhappy. So things actually, they just have to be perfect. <laughs> I went into, um, I was in Hong Kong last year and I went to a Zaha Hadid project. It was the, it's the School of Architecture there. And it's got this cool atrium space. Did I tell you the story of the elevators already? I can never remember. I'm getting old. So they're, they're, it's all architecture students. And so I'm kind of wandering, meandering through, and they're letting me there with my camera. It was great. No one was bothering me. So I'm walking through this gorgeous atrium, and I walked all the way to the 13th floor, which was the top floor. So they have a series of stair ramps, like long, long <laughs> stairs that go all the way up the middle. <clears throat> and so most of the students were taking the elevator. Because, you know, they have this beautiful atrium with these stair ramps, but it's faster to take the elevator, but maybe. So there's these two students that were there, and they had some models and stuff, and we're all waiting for the elevator to go down, and the elevator took forever. It just took forever. And they walked into the, the elevator. We finally got into this elevator, and they said to, said to each other, and here they are in a very famous high-end Zaha Hadid project, this building sucks. <laughs> Why? Because the elevator was slow. Okay? So all that mattered to them was that they had to go from the friggin' 13th floor down to the ground floor for a crit with their model, and they weren't going to be carrying that down through all these long <laughs> stair ramps in the atrium to get there into the elevator, and it took forever to come, so the building sucked. Right? doesn't matter. Everything has to be perfect. So one of the things that I want you to keep in mind as we go through the course and as you go through architecture school <coughs> is this idea of the skeleton and the general separation of the function of the structure of the building from the envelope. Because what will happen to you when you start to do studio projects you will forget this, and you will begin to design everything as a load-bearing wall, which means that the <coughs> holding up of the building function and the envelope are merged. So in a load-bearing wall, this is a load-bearing wall. It's all holding up the building in a, res in a regular house. The frame is holding up the building and the insulation is packed in between that wood. And so in a load-bearing building, the environmental requirements of the skin are merged with the structure, which is very difficult to do well because it's very unforgiving. So in a, in a wood frame envelope, if there's any moisture migration, leakage, anything that happens that, that works its way from the outside of the building in, or the inside of the building out, gets stuck somewhere in the wall, turns into condensation, turns into mold and rot and all that, it's all hidden in the structure and it's going to ruin the structure. Whereas if you look back at that, <clears throat> the only thing that's going to wreck that structure would probably be an earthquake or a really severe hurricane. The wall gets put on last and it's Thin, typically fairly thin, and made kind of like a sandwich panel of, a la of layers of ingredients. So when you're designing buildings, keep in mind that the majority of buildings are designed with columns 
beams, slabs, and they are constructed that way. If you try to keep in the back of your mind, how would I build this? It might help you to sort out how you would um, imagine a tackling the wall system. And so when we're looking at building science, then we're looking at all these methods of heat transfer mechanisms that are going from the outside to the inside. We've got infiltration, and I'll talk about these one, one by one, <coughs> of air infiltrating. We've got radiation, solar radiation, sunshine. We've got convection, which would be um, heat flow currents that will actually pull the heat out. And conduction, which is basically the physics that things flow from hot to cold. <coughs> so all these heat transfer mechanisms happen on the envelope. The other really big reason for this has to do with protecting your structure from temperature change. So if the building envelope is outboard of the structure, then the structure is always at the temperature it is inside. So if you keep your building at 23 degrees Celsius, that's it for the structure. It's not going to expand or contract due to heat. You're going to keep your humidity levels pretty standard. So if it's wood, it's not going to take on moisture, give off moisture. It's going to be stable. As soon as you bury it, then there's all sorts of temperature fluctuations and moisture fluctuations in that wall. And that wall has a lot more work to do in order to stay intact and good. So if you start to bury steel structure in your wall, etc., then you end up with uh, problems because the steel will expand and contract and move and it, it moves quite a bit when you heat it up and that's going to start to pull the building apart. And so <clears throat> we look at our, our building envelope then as an environmental moderator. It has to sort of mediate between inside and outside and in order to satisfy this there are four major things it has to control. Heat flow. And heat flows from <coughs> hot to cold. If you sit with your shorts, you get into a car where there's a nice leather seat in the summertime, and your bum feels hot, that's because the heat from the seat is flowing into you, making you feel hot. If you sit with a pair of shorts on that same seat in the wintertime and it's really cold, then the reason that your butt feels cold is that the heat from your body, which is warmer than the seat, is getting pulled down into the seat <coughs> to warm up the seat. So it always flows to equalize. So if you're hotter, it'll flow to cold, or vice versa. Airflow. We have the op opportunity sometimes to open windows to have air flow in and out of the buildings for natural ventilation. Um, we also have airflow around buildings. So the big, you know, big failures in the hurricanes that the, the South has been ex experiencing in the last month are failures with respect to airflow. The buildings couldn't withstand the airflow. The airflow was strong enough that it trashed some of those buildings. <coughs> Movement of water as a vapor and a liquid. <coughs> so we can pretty clearly understand that if it's raining, we want the rain outside. If it's snowing, we want the snow outside. But the other thing that we have inside of a building <coughs> is water vapor. So everybody breathing is putting vapor in this room that's probably full of all sorts of germs. Um, and if it's hot in here and cold out there, then that vapor, we've got high pressure in here, that vapor's trying to go through the wall to the outside. And so in, in houses where we've got washing machines and people taking ten, taking 10 showers a day and doing all sorts of the wet stuff and making it really humid, all of that in the wintertime is trying to work its way through the building envelope to go outside 
and ending up getting the inside of the building envelope wet. <coughs> and then solar and other kinds of radiation, but normally solar radiation. Our Earth doesn't have too much radiation, although there are some locations where the Earth and that has a radon gas as a, a naturally occurring part of the Earth, and it's carcinogenic, and so when you are building in an area where the Earth has radon gas, you have to be quite careful to properly seal the basement to keep the radon gas out. So if you ever decide to move into a house that has a mud basement floor, be a bit skeptical. Building envelopes are like balloons. In the old days, building envelopes were really robust and thick, pretty, pretty accommodating. But because of this tendency to make structural frames and to put the envelope on the exterior, it can, it can be very thin. It is now very thin, and therefore it behaves like a balloon. You put one little hole in it, and it doesn't work so well. And so we have to detail things very precisely. We have to understand that if we have flaws in the envelope, we've got holes in the envelope, that moisture is going to go in and out, heat is going to go in and out, and understanding that this sort of hot, moist environment inside drives the air out, like a balloon. So you're blowing up a balloon, you're pressurizing the balloon with hot, moist air. You're breathing just like you're breathing here, making that balloon big, hole in that balloon, it goes. Right? Air goes out. So same with our, our building envelopes. The building envelope is like a fur coat. So back in the day, before people, uh, before anybody invented uh, fin finsulite insulation, etc. People wore fur coats. Hudson Bay Company was big in Canada because fur coats were the most warm thing people could wear to survive winters. Um, and I always say this to my dog. I mean, when I go out, you know, in the wintertime, and I'm like, I go to walk the dog, and he's ready. He's standing in the door, I'm ready. What's taking you so long? So I don't have a fur coat. I'm trying to be politically correct here. You know what I mean? I have to put on this layer, and this layer, and this layer, and gloves, and a hat. And it's really incredible when you look at birds. Little teeny birds in the wintertime. And they're out and it's like minus 20. And they just got feathers. And if I just put on a few feathers, I think I'd freeze. Um, and so the, the way that these work is by trapping air between... So it's, it's not a solid, it is something that actually has a lot of air trapped. And it's the air that's trapped between the, the bits of fur that actually helps with the, the insulation value quite a bit. And with animals, they are, they're just built differently. But the idea of the fur is to provide insulation. So in our buildings, our insulation is our fur coat. And there's loads of different kinds of insulation. I'll talk to you about them here and there throughout the course. But essentially, <clears throat> when it comes to thickness and reducing the speed at which heat leaves the building, or heat, if it's hot outside, cool inside, heat enters the building, it's a more is more scenario. So not Mies van der Rohe with less is more. This is more is more. More insulation is generally better. Um, but that brings with it a lot of detailing challenges because typically buildings <coughs> that are made out of 38 by 140 studs, two by sixes, they're about that big, have that much insulation in. So if we look at a typical wall, and this is the way you have back insulation. <coughs> That's 140 millimeters, <coughs> and that's fitting between a stud and a stud wall. Now, if I say more is more, and we're trying to be really <coughs> energy conscious, and we try to go <coughs> super low carbon on buildings and cut down on our fossil fuels, you'll see me write 
here and there that if we want to do it, we need to go 1.5 to 2 times the insulation levels. So this might be what's required by building code. But what we have to understand is building code is a minimum set of requirements to save the public from us being absolute idiots and our clients being just really stingy with their money. Okay, so that's just to protect the public. So if I say we, got, we want to go one, one and a half to two times to make something better, well, if we go two times, you know, then we're looking at a wall that's this big. Well, we just went from having these thin walls back to these massive thick walls and saying, well, how the heck would you build that? Well, I can tell you that this particular insulation is cheap and therefore it's not as expensive. So we can go for a more expensive insulation that's thinner and maybe by changing the kind of insulation, you know, we could get a wall that's maybe only requires to be this thick, but it's got, you know, a different kind of insulation that's going in it. So there's a lot of different kinds of insulation that will we'll feed into solving different aspects of the problem. Um, the other thing with insulation types <coughs> has to do with keeping them dry. So anything that's like a bat insulation, um, it's like if you were to wear a, a, a sweatshirt. Sweatshirts are great when they're dry. How good is a sweatshirt at keeping you warm when it's soaking wet? <coughs> Probably not so good. In fact, what happens when the sweatshirt gets wet is it's actually conducting heat from your body. So you're actually getting cold faster than probably if you just took that sweatshirt off and just dealt with the elements. And so different kinds of insulation also cannot get wet. And so some of them are useful in walls because we design walls to be dry. Other ones you might be using on roofs because flat roofs, etc., will have water sitting on them. And even though technically they shouldn't be getting wet, the likelihood of them getting wet is greater, so they put um, insulation that could be exposed, exposed to water in, in places where this could happen. Okay, buildings have to provide shelter from the rain. <coughs> Much like the, the man with the umbrella. So I think a roof is like an umbrella. I would say this is particularly true for residential buildings in a cold climate like ours. Because the roof is not only like an umbrella for rain, but it's also an umbrella for snow. And generally speaking, if it's really raining out, you would probably, you know, go to the front hall of your house. You're going to pick the big umbrella. Like I, I take the golf umbrella. I don't golf, but I have a golf umbrella. For those days where like I want something that's going out to here, thank you very much. I don't want the little one from Shoppers Drug Mart that, that packs up so I can fit it in my purse. And then you sort of you, you pull it out and you put it up and you go like, don't be windy because you know that it, it's going to be windy and you're going to be wet because it's just going to be inside out. <laughs> See, it makes a big difference if you have a big umbrella. <coughs> big umbrellas for big problems. <coughs> so the size of a roof overhang, roofs are actually there to protect our buildings from the rain because what we are trying to do is not only shed the water. So if you, if you had a, a building... A lot of people draw buildings like this. <coughs> it's, it's almost as bad as this. <laughs> right? We don't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> buildings have those and the purpose of that is to not only protect from the sun, so you're going to shade the building when it's raining <coughs> then the water is going to drip away from the building 
so that it doesn't end up splashing back and wetting the building. <coughs> because what you'll see on buildings that have <coughs> walls that are exposed, you're going to see a lot of wetting. If it's raining, and you have a window, the window's shut. If you have an overhang and you have a window, you can actually have the window open to let air flow through the building. So the whole idea of a, a, a roof overhang isn't just an aesthetic one, although I think the aesthetics of big overhangs, personally, I find they, they look really great on a lot of residential <coughs> architecture. That one you can see is doing some nice shadowing. These ones are sort of a cheap builder um, building and the, the roof overhangs aren't that big. They, they'll help with the wetting a little bit, uh, but not that much. But you know, you find with, with roof, uh, buildings with flat roofs and they have other problems associated with the fact that the wall is exposed to the moisture the more often you wet and dry and wet and dry and freeze and thaw a wall or any material, the faster it will deteriorate. So if you keep it dry, it'll stay good. It'll stay durable longer. So this begins to feed into durability. And also the idea that when we're looking at passive buildings, if it's really hot and you get a rainstorm, and you have to shut all the windows. It's really annoying to be inside, sweltering, with no airflow, knowing that you could get a breeze, but the fact that you can't open the windows because there's no roof overhang. And so try to, try to be able to, as you're growing in a modern, modern era of construction, to work the, the idea that actually the fact that sloped roofs work better in our climate with the tendency of modern buildings to have flat roofs. And it's also one of those things that will happen to you from time to time, whereby it'll, it'll be almost deadline time. You'll have your, your floor plan will be drawn. <coughs> Right? You've got your door, you've got whatever walls, you've got your floor plan, you've got a few windows in. And then you look at the list of drawings and it says, I need drop. I forgot the elevations. And what you're going to do is you're going to go and you're going to extrude it and you're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Screw those drawings up and bam, horizontal rule, I'm done. Um, you've just wrecked the building because you've just put, you exposed all the walls on the whole thing to the sun, to the rain, to the wind, for the expediency of, of pulling it up and, and striking a line across without detailing the, the sloped roof. Um, however, though, when you do detail a flat roof in section, It does not look like that. <laughs> it has bunny ears. Flat rooms have parapets. Go and look at buildings. I said to you at the very beginning, when I met you on Frosh Day, open your eyes and see differently. I want you to, if you can, find me examples of Residential buildings, office buildings, apartment buildings, schools, libraries, I don't care what building type, find me a building whose roof does that. Nope. There are some really rare, wacky examples that are using metal cladding, like sort of, sort of Frank Gehry sheet metal coming around corners. Not those. I'm just talking something that's got a roof and a wall that's got a corner like that. How the heck would you seal it? You buy somebody like a whole gal in the bathtub caulking and say, yep, just silicone that joint between the brick. 
you know, smite the brick, smite the brick at the corner like that, right? And then you'll have your roofing material will come like that, right? It'll just put a big blob of caulk in there. So when we're designing things, typically in our climate, a slope <coughs> would be better than a flat roof. Now you will find faculty here of different opinions. Some of us are more right than others. <laughs> That's okay. Donald Mackay and I agree on the slope roof thing because we both suffered through leaking flat roofs. I have a flat roof at, at my house that we finally, finally, finally got fixed this year. <coughs> that was, it was, at one point this past winter, we had a five gallon bucket and we would just empty it because there was so much rain at one point and, the, and there was a hole in the flat roof and it's really hard to find a hole in the flat roof. The only way you can fix it is to do the whole roof. So we finally got that fixed. So the other, the other um, piece that flat roofs are good for, now this is a, the Bullet Center in Seattle is a really, really high-end eco building. It's the Living Building Challenge winner, et cetera, et cetera. But they have a huge roof, and one of the things that they did in getting permission from the city to have that big an overhang, they are powering much of the building with photovoltaics, and they needed more roof space. And so that big, huge roof plane that they have there that's not only shading the building and protecting the walls and allowing them to have windows open even on a, a multi-story building is covered with PV on the roof, so they have a bigger, uh, bigger surface area for... Uh, farming electricity. And so when we're looking at <coughs> the whole idea of roofs and roof overhangs, and you can go through the little uh, PDF of the CMH, CMHC um, house guide. I gave you a link to a little PDF, and you'll see more drawings like this. But this just gives you an idea of what you're keeping out in terms of rain, wind-driven rain, water, and what you have to sort of um, allow to happen, so drying, et cetera, in the wall, and we'll talk more about rain screens, et cetera, but just to understand that there's a lot that's going on in walls. They, they've got a lot of work to do to keep all the bad things out, and when some of the bad things get in, to try to um, vent them, allow a little air to come in to, to dry them out so that they don't get all moldy and, and mildewy. So we talked in, uh, earlier about bioclimatic design, and just to stress that a lot of what we, we talk about in the class will do with all climate zones, and some of them are very specific to cold climate. So what I've been speaking about right now is very specific to a fairly cold climate and trying to mitigate operating energy with that building envelope. So I introduced you my, my poster children for the climate zones and to always you know, keep in mind when we're talking about anything to think, well, how would I apply this to this climate zone or that climate zone? And so we looked at hot, <coughs> hot climate, we talked about diurnal. So these would be solid mass walls and so a lot of buildings like this are not built with column <coughs> systems. They are often built with very sort of load bearing systems. And again, any time that we're looking at something that's climate related, I'll introduce this software to you in a couple of weeks, but we have to look at verifying what the climate is. So if we look at hot areas, how do people respond to that architecturally? One of the things that you do in, in, to try to use uh, the building to control light and the sun Obviously, we use really small windows to keep the heat out, but we also couple that with very, very light stuccoed surfaces. So any light that just that does come into the small areas between buildings gets bounced around. So it's a very bright space. So even though the, the openings are small, the space itself is very bright and uplifting feeling. You can imagine that if instead of being white stucco, you made all of those out of the, the sort of the new trendy gray black brick. So substitute, you know, modern gray black brick instead of white stucco and you'd end up with a place that was black, it would be absorbing the sun, it would be super hot, it would be sucking in the light, it would be really dark, 
and it wouldn't be very nice. So it's a material that's really fine for contemporary projects that are you know, set in, in settings that allow for a lot of light penetration, but would be bad in this climate. So a lot of materials we pick are very climate specific. Courtyard buildings. People like courtyard types. I mean, courtyards are really cool to think about. And every, every student, I think, goes through school and, yeah, not a courtyard. <coughs> really like courtyards. Well, the interesting thing about courtyards in the old houses in, in Pompeii would be that if we're, if we're designing a courtyard and we've got columns around the middle, The rooms are back here. And the corridor is outside. So you would go in and out of your room. So this would be closed spaces in here. And so that you could get cross ventilation into the courtyard through the corridor. So it's not like here where all of a sudden we would have to put glass around that. And basically it's just and enclosed corridors, so it's not so exciting anymore. Um, the other thing that they, they were able to do here, if you look at the general the cross section, they would slope the, um, <coughs> the roofs in so that they would actually have a cistern <coughs> underneath the center of the courtyard, so they were using this as a way to gather water. So all the water would drain into the center of the courtyard, be gathered in the cistern, and so the cistern would provide for water. But also, the sun angles were such that if they, when they wanted sun into the courtyard, they, the, the courtyards were big enough and the sun was high enough in the Mediterranean to let the sun come in. So if we, if we take a, a cold climate example, same scale, our, our courtyard, and understand that in the winter time on December 21, the, the maximum angle of the sun above the horizon is 21 degrees at noon. We have something that's like dark. That's the highest the sun gets all day. So we can we can design courtyards in cold climates that are absolutely miserable because unless they're really really big, which is I highly unlikely given the space that's required, they're going to be nasty um, in, in the wintertime in terms of, of sun and sun penetration. So next we can look at, at solar geometry because it really begins to impact sort of laying out spaces um, and, and what, will, what will and won't work when we go beyond plan and, and into section. So <coughs> hot climate cathedrals. In, in the Gothic period, we had cathedrals where the big thing was to create those flying buttresses and big rose windows and all the big windows to let the light in, <coughs> to make people feel uplifted and close to God and, and whatever came with those cathedrals. They were still Christian in, in, in Italy, except that it was hot. So in France, it was cold and damp. In England, it was colder and damper. Um, and in Italy, it's it's hot Mediterranean climate, so they wanted to feel uplifted and all that, but they didn't want to be hot. So the windows are much, much smaller, and they didn't make the same kind of structural inventions or adaptations because they didn't need to. They didn't want big windows. <coughs> you know, just because they were in fashion somewhere else in Europe that they'd never heard of because no one had walked there. Um, so then we switch to hot humid and look at very sort of light materials. <coughs> And again, what we always, always have to verify with humidity and then look at you know, what we can do for a hot, humid cathedral. <coughs> with humidity, we want airflow. So a lot of the sort of, sort of back, back to the earth cathedrals, religious gathering spaces in these kind of climates have no walls. It's just a roof to provide shade. You want maximum ventilation. So thinking about the impact of climate. Temperate, again, fairly even distribution of heat, 
and then cold, which we'll focus on a bit more today because the most severe stresses on the envelope are due to high temperatures and pressure <laughs> differences here. In a temperate environment, if it's the same temperature outside as inside, there's no force. You can't have a forced flow if it's the same. You have to have a delta T or a delta pressure in order to make something, to, to have a push or a pull on temperature and pressure, and the air pressure is the one that's, that's fueling the, the vapors. So again, you're looking for a, a climate graph that looks like that, and you go like, whoa, that's really cold. <coughs> so I went, <clears throat> when I was traveling years and years ago, we were, we were going to visit some friends in Boston early December. This is when my oldest two kids, one was two, and the other was six. So I used to, we used to drive all night in order to not have to deal with grumpy children. So my husband and I would be grumpy when we got there, but children, we'd give them to our friends, and it was all good. So we were going to drive home all night. So we set out from Boston, the beginning of December, a beautiful, beautiful sunny day, <coughs> coming across and turned north at Syracuse, <coughs> and it started to snow. And it started to snow, and it snowed, and it snowed. And it's like, like, Arm, like snowmageddon, like what is going on here? We had within an hour, I think it was, it was three feet of snow. And I had, we were driving a little Honda Accord with the, with the two kids in the back, and it, the snow was coming up. And there, there was hardly any traffic on the roads. Like everybody else knew not to be traveling at that point in time. So it's dark out. We're going up an incline, and there was a, a transport truck straight ahead of us to, to my husband's right. My husband was driving. And all of a sudden, the transport truck <laughs> jackknifed. And it jackknifed right in front of us. And so the, the snowbank to, to, our, to our left was about that tall. And then there was the road, and there was the transport truck. And I just screamed, look out. And so my, my now middle daughter was in the back seat, two years old, very obedient, looked out the window. <laughs> <laughs> you said look out, right? The, the three posts of the passenger side of the car hit the, the um, transport truck, and so it, it didn't shear the top of the car off, but it cracked all of the glass. So the whole back glass fell out. The glass fell out all down my back at my, the, the, my side. The front window cracked across, but it, it, it didn't have any holes in it. And my, littlest, my little daughter at that time was facing out the window. It was intact. Oh. Those are kind of like, you go like, whoa, that was like too scary. So then we're sitting there in the middle of this, and the, the, tractor, the tractor trailer driver, he never came to see if we were okay. He ignored us. So there I am in the middle. And so this was back in the day, I had, I had a cell phone. And you, you, this was really a big deal to have a cell phone back then because it was probably about that tall, and it was this it was like carrying a brick. So anyway, I'm in the middle of like wherever in New York City, like 911. Like, where are you? Damned if I know. I'm in a snowstorm, but our car just got kind of totaled, and we can't drive it. And I've got two small kids in the car. So <clears throat> they actually did send a, a state trooper to pick us up. My poor husband had to drive the car with all the snow blowing in following the state trooper to get the car to off, off the road and to a, a, the hotel. But it was, it was like really <laughs> freaky. We could, you couldn't see anything. You were going so slow, there would be those little red flat, um, reflector discs at the side of the road, and <clears throat> you couldn't even see those. It was just petrifying. So anyway, we got to um, Watertown, New York, <clears throat> and we got the last room in this Ramada Inn. And a Ramada, Ramada inns were not really the best designed. It wouldn't have been my top choice. But when it's the only room left in a snowstorm and you have a wrecked car, you, you, you just take what you get. So we walked into this room, and these are shots the next day. So the, the wall 
The outside wall was mostly glass. So we walked into the room, and the first thing I was struck by was the fact that I could hear a fan running. And went into the bathroom, and the bathroom fan was on. But the fat bathroom fan was broken on. And so it was effectively depressurizing the unit, right? It was exhausting air from the unit. So then it, it, I, we had the drapes were drawn across the outside wall. So you said, oh, yeah, we made it. We're out of the snowstorm. Yay, everybody, kids. It's so great. <laughs> Open the drape. Between the drape and the glass was solid with snow because the wall was so badly constructed that there was so many little places for air to come through that it had sucked the snow from the snowstorm outside because of the negative pressure from the, the bathroom fan being on all the time that we had a wall of snow that was about this tall. So then we proceeded to take all the garbage cans that were in the room, which was probably two of them, and we, we were like shoveling the snow and putting it in the, in the tub in order to melt it so that we didn't have the snow melting in the room and it was kind of cold feeling anyway with the snow bank in, inside the, the motel room. But we couldn't really request another space because there wasn't one. So, I mean, that's the kind of bad detailing that architecture can provide and the people who designed that building probably would build the same Ramada Inn down in, in Florida or in Arizona or wherever, they didn't change it based on design. So when you design for the cold climate then, you have to be you know, really conscious of making sure that buildings are, are sealed tightly and so that the air and the moisture goes in and out where you say it does. Like you want people to come in and out the front door. You don't want to find that someone's like crawled up through a crack that's above the window and you know belly flopped in and said, I'm here. You're supposed to come in the front door. Oh, but the window was sort of open. <laughs> so we ended up with very, this is our traditional, I would say, inferior cold climate design where people came from Europe dom predominantly in the late 1800s early part of the 1900s and built houses that looked like this. So solid masonry, um, no insulation, wasn't, <coughs> wasn't invented, <coughs> relatively small windows because it was a solid masonry building, so those were the limits of the openings, etc. At least there were sloped roofs, and so we would have at least some snow being, being shed off the roofs and some overhangs. But nonetheless, it it's, wasn't really a, a, a good style of uh, construction because the, the envelope didn't perform very well. <coughs> Problems we have nowadays is that a lot of these houses still exist. I am sure that probably half of you, if you're living in older houses in Cambridge, are living in houses very much like this that have no insulation. So again... <coughs> The cathedrals, the cold climate, you're looking at this idea of bringing light into buildings. So I want to talk about the enemy of architecture. And I would say that, you know, in, in order to start a battle, and this is kind of a battle you've, you've taken on, the battle of architecture school and building buildings. And in building science, we have battles that we have to wage. There's some battles that, you know, you would you just say, oh, I'm not going to worry about that battle. It's not important enough. This is an important battle. That one's not so important. Somebody's giving you a crit on your design. There's some things that you're going to fight tooth and nail for no matter what they think. I am not getting rid of this thing. It's my favorite part of the building. I've always wanted to have one of these. When I got to architecture school, don't take that away. But one of the enemies that we always have to deal with is water, rain. Um, because it's one of the things that's really important to good building envelope design. And, and for the people who suffered through the, the hurricanes in the south, if their buildings did not actually fall over, a lot of them were flooding because water was just coming in anyway. Combined with water is the notion of humidity, that we have to deal with humidity, um, airborne humidity, humidity in buildings, humidity in the building envelope. And so we have to change our design practices based on how humid an environment we live in. 
So what's been bothering a lot of people in the past couple of weeks of this really hot weather. And I think that the people who announce the weather on the radio are evil people. Because they, they always they say, oh, it's going to be 29 today, but 40 with the Humidex. You know, they get that kind of evil, ha, 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 Humidex. You know, like, yeah, it's going to feel horrible. But if it wasn't humid, it would be 29. If it was dry, it wouldn't be so bad. So it's the humidity that's the, the, the difficult part. <coughs> so the rain itself is a problem enough. Acid rain is worse. Because acid rain, which happens when we get all of the emissions from our buildings, our cars, into the environment, so um, silicon dioxide, CO2, nitrous oxide, all goes in and it goes up into the atmosphere, it comes back down in the rain. So it does a couple of things. Um, anybody who's up, has cottages up in Muskoka's will find that your lakes are clearer and clearer and clearer. That's because your lakes are acidifying, which also succeeds in killing <coughs> off the fish, because most fish don't like to live in acid, just a thing. They have a certain sort of alkalinity to the lake that they prefer. And it also ends up coming down on our, our, our plants in the cities, and it comes down on our buildings. <coughs> this is the result of acid rain in Europe. So stone is a material that's particularly vulnerable to degradation from acid rain. So you get not only the water coming <coughs> on the buildings, but the soot from the environment, from the dirty air, sits on there, and then eventually it just it eats away the, the, the sculptures, the stone surfaces. So there's a lot of really severe and basically irreparable degradation on a lot of the cathedrals in Europe and the exterior <coughs> carvings because of acid rain. So again, the more that we clean up the environment and go to you know, buildings that don't emit as much um, uh, gases, cars that can maybe go electric someday so they're not also making um, particulates into the environment, the better it will be. But sadly, this is what it is and it will never probably get fixed. The other byproduct would be, I would say, staining of buildings, whereby a lot of buildings um, <coughs> They, they just look dirty. They've got dirt patterns on them. So this is the Medical Arts Building in uh, Toronto, U of T campus just behind um, Queen's Park. And, you know, it's kind of interesting looking, I guess, if you want to give it a positive spin. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting staining on that building. But, yeah, look, it's black. And I still don't understand the patterns. It's, it's kind of peculiar. So we have to design for our four seasons, and we need to have performance throughout all of those seasons. So in cold climate is the dominant one for here, but we also need to modify for